our last speaker for, for the conference is Stephen Hay. And if you've been around for all the speaker introductions, you'll notice that the theme is random, obscure facts, and you'll realize that our speakers are either musically inclined or like fairly athletic. Stephen hits the trifecta whereby he does karate. He also used to play the baritone saxophone. And from the artistic standpoint, he started out dabbling in graffiti way back before the internet stuff came in. So please give a warm round of applause for our last speaker, Stephen Hay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, this is... Uh... You had to expect this, right? Okay. This is Russell Acoff. Um, some of you might know who he is. One of the pioneers of modern systems thinking. And I'm a big fan. And I saw a video of a conference talk that he did where he was the last speaker after many very good speakers. And he said that being the last speaker after many good speakers is like showing a pornographic movie to people who have just engaged in sex. And this is pretty much how I feel right now. It's been a great conference with a bunch of very good speakers. Um, so it's kind of hard to, to follow that up, uh, but I'll do my best. Um, I'm Stephen Hay. I am creative director at a bank called Rabobank. In English, that's Rabobank. It's the name of the bank. It's not an invitation. <laughs> um, of course, we're hiring uh, front-end developers and designers as well. My background is graphic design. Uh, I did corporate identity design and packaging design back in the day. And in 1995, I made my first website, and I fell in love with the web. And I really, I, I never wanted to go back. It's so great. And... Um, I still, uh, I'm a designer who codes, basically. Are there more of those here? Yeah? I think there are probably more of you. So maybe at the end of the talk, we'll, uh, we'll chat again. I think there are a lot of designers who code, and coders who are actually more designers than maybe they think. Um, so the, the talk today is about design systems, and you might think, well, design systems right now is kind of a contentious topic. Why would, you, uh, why would you talk about design systems? And that's because I hate myself and I need to be punished for things I've done in the past. So <laughs> I decided to do a design systems talk. And the talk is when design systems lie, but it could have been called when design systems don't work as expected because of our unrealistic expectations based on the lack of a holistic view of the larger system. But that is a stupid name for a talk. So um, the, the question on our minds, or at least my mind, is do design systems cause good design? Do, d does good design come from design systems? So is there anyone here who, how many, I, I assume many people work with design systems or you have one in your company, right? Um, it is, are all your design problems solved now and you have fantastic design? Raise your hand. <laughs> I want to talk to you after. <laughs> it's, it's not the case, but why is it not the case? Because we spend a lot of time and effort and money and people um, working on design systems, and we have a goal for that. And I want to circle back at the end of the talk to what that goal actually might be. But first... Let's draw a system. So um, in my mental model, this is, uh, we're going to draw a causal loop diagram. So if you're familiar with systems thinking, then you'll be familiar with this or system dynamics. This is just a simple way to, to kind of illustrate a mental model of a system. For me, design decisions is kind of um, one of the most important parts of such a system. And design reality is... Uh, usually something different, right? And so you want your design decisions, you make those decisions so that you can influence design reality. And in a causal loop diagram, you would have an S, 
A little s means that these things go in the same direction. Some people use a plus. So the more design decisions you make, the more influence you would have on that design reality. And there's always a difference between the desired state of design and the reality. And that difference leads to the amount of design decisions or the severity of the design decisions that you might make. So that's also an S that goes in the same direction. The design reality uh, either closes or uh, opens the distance between um, the, the reality and the desired design state. So this is an O, which is the opposite direction. The more reality uh, fits with how you want it to be, uh, the less of a difference there is between these two. And there's this uh, thing we call a dangle here, which is design intent, which is basically the focus of my job on a daily basis, is to say uh, what direction should the design go um, into. And this is also um, an S, so that influences that difference. If I say it should be something completely different, uh, that potentially widens the gap between reality and the desired state. So this is kind of a little, it's not a complete system, but it's a little loop. And what they would call this in systems thinking is a balancing loop. And that's because the more decisions you make, the more you close the gap. Um, and uh, if, you, if your design changes, it opens the gap, so it kind of balances itself out. But systems are never this simple. So we have these other things that might influence the design decisions that you make. And can someone name one of those things? I'm looking for one specific one. A hint is this whole talk is about it. <laughs> design systems. So you have a system, and I have these, these open circles there because a design system is in itself either one or more, probably way more, of these kind of loops. And there's another kind of loop which is a reinforcing loop, and that um, if you don't keep that in check, then it just cycles and cycles and cycles uh, exponentially. So um, this is kind of my model of how, uh, how d a design system could look. But the interesting part of this is what? Design system, as we call it, is just one little dot in this whole thing, right? So that is the fact that every system is contained in another system. And this is where part of the problem comes in. If uh, we talk about design systems, it's funny because the larger the organization is, and I was used to uh, um, smaller organizations and I would go into larger organizations, and now I'm in a larger organization. The difference being that um, people listen to you <laughs> when you're not in the organization and they hire you. And then once you work there, it's a lot harder uh, to work on things. So uh, we tend to work in silos, especially in large organizations. And we're always talking about things at scale. And at scale means in large companies where things are really, really difficult. But those are exactly the places where everyone's in these little uh, silos. So um, probably I can sum up most of this talk by saying zoom out because there's not only one system. The thing you're working on, like Micah mentioned in her talk, everything is interconnected. You will not stop finding connections between the small things that you do and the effects somewhere else that you probably even never even thought of. Um, so it's very important to understand those things. And that's another uh, takeaway I had from Micah's talk is that it's a lot of effort to, to gain understanding about systems that you might not uh, know about. So you could say design systems inform design decisions, but is that is that really, really the case? Or should it be? Should we have it in uh, look more like this? This would be for me a more preferable uh, diagram. Um, I'd like it to be this way, where the design to system, uh, system does inform the decisions that you make, um, but the decisions inform the reality, and the reality feeds back into the design system. Okay, so we'll touch on this a little bit um, later, but to sum up, it means that reality should inform design systems, 
and design decisions should inform reality. So what you want to do here is integrate the things you're doing in your design system with the way the world actually works. And that, unfortunately, is not always the case. So when I talk about design decisions, I like to use this photo. And this photo is, it's not a stock photo, a lot of people think that, but I took this photo myself um, at a conference venue that I spoke at many years ago. And there's this particular area of interest in this photo. And the area, area of interest is uh, there because what the hell were these people thinking when they designed this thing? Um, so that's, uh, that probably wasn't part of a design system. That was one of those other open circles that I showed you. One of them might be constraints. So we don't know what was going on here. Um, I, I actually used one of these <laughs> and was hoping the entire time that no one would like, you know, use the one right next to it. But um, this is a decision that someone made. It's it was uh, a conscious thing because there are so many steps to get to a completed uh, restroom like this. Uh, it can't be that no one noticed it, right? So what was it? Maybe there was some regulation. You have to have at least that many urinals. Um, and somehow they didn't realize that if you put two of these together, then you're only going to use one if you use any at all, because most people would be afraid uh, to use this. So... This, could, this is uh, another set of factors or a system of factors that could tie into the design decisions that you make in addition to the design systems that you have. So there are N factors in making any decision where N is a really, really annoying number every single time, <laughs> right? So um, there are stories that we tell ourselves about what design system, systems are and do, and uh, that determines everything, how we build these things, how we interact with them, how we communicate to people about them. And when I say stories, I mean lies, of course. And uh, we'll just go through them. I only have six, um, and the sixth one is the most important, so I'll just kind of work up to that. And uh, lie number one is that most design systems aren't glorified um, component libraries, <laughs> which uh, most of them are. So if we're really honest, You've got some, uh, you know, styled elements. Some of them you've made yourself. Some of them are just HTML, and they're in a bucket, and we have a team of people working on them and optimizing them and that kind of thing. And that's it. They're a component library, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, um, where I work, and I, a couple of them, I think, are somewhere, a couple of the developers are here, uh, I think, and... They've, they recognize this, and they don't call it a design system. They call it a component library, or there's, there's another word for it, but there's, uh, uh, we, we have our own name for it, but it's, it's just about the components, and that's fine. In fact, it's honest, because then we know what we're talking about. So then what's the design system? Uh, we'll get into that. But um, Jeremy's going to kill me for quoting myself, but... Uh, I have to do it because Brad Frost put this quote that I think I said it at a conference talk in 2011. Uh, this is how he starts his book, Atomic Design, with this quote. And if you don't know the context of the quote, then you'll think that I'm talking about technology. But the quote was about a design approach, a way of looking at design and not technology. Um, it wasn't very, uh, very many years before uh, I had the talk where I said that, where designers were using Photoshop to make pictures of what the website should look like, and these pictures were never uh, what the website actually looked like, right? And th actually, that hasn't changed a whole lot. We just have other tooling for designers to, um, you know, fantasize about what their websites might look like. But um, the uh, this was about thinking in terms of not static pages, but as designers, it was meant for designers. Think about um, all these little bits that you can maybe reuse and put together in different ways. Uh, that's not maybe how you design it, but you have to think about that reuse. This is a different world than just uh, two-dimensional uh, making a poster or something like that. One of the first component 
libraries that I ever saw is actually Jeremy's pattern primer. You remember that, <laughs> Jeremy? Long time ago. And it's not that much different than a lot of so-called designed systems, uh, systems today, except that you probably don't have to spend 10 minutes uh, waiting for all this NPM stuff to, to happen to get these things to render on a page. It's just HTML. And it's also easy to know what these elements should be used for because most of them are just HTML. Like a block quote is for quotes. You know, paragraphs are for paragraphs, things like that. So once we um, open the Pandora's box of creating our own elements, then we also um, kind of are on the hook to get designers and other people who use the system to gain an understanding of what those elements mean and how they should be used together. So components are necessary, but they're not sufficient. It's not enough. And a collection of things is not a system. It's just a collection. And that's fine, but we have to admit it to ourselves and not make it bigger than it really is. So when components are really, really interesting is when we think about how these can interact with each other and when we communicate that so that people know what they're going to do with this stuff, right? Um, this is why you should probably... Uh, I know that there are some big companies who have these really complex and very impressive design systems, and a lot of smaller companies, or even bigger companies, they look to these as examples. But as I mentioned in a, um, the last talk I did, which was three years ago now, you can't ignore your own data in your own context and assume that the, the context of someone else will work for you. That's the worst thing that you can do. You might find some commonalities there, but you have to look at your own context. So I don't want to depress you all with just the lies, so I'll, I'll give you a, a way to get to the truth. Seek understanding about the environments that contain your system. Okay, What's outside of, these, uh, of the component library? How is it used? Um, if you have more than a component library, how is that used? If you tie into Figma, uh, who's using it through the organization? How do they use it? Find out as much as you can. You have to kind of do a mica, you know, and, and get that information to uh, really understand. It's kind of like what you would do with a product, a uh, UX design of a product. Okay, so... Design systems lie number two is that documentation is optional. I had an interesting discussion with Yuna uh, the other evening, um, and I, I think she's right. She said, um, no one reads documentation. So then it comes down to what do you mean by documentation and what does that mean to particular people? So documentation can take many forms. And in fact, most of the people here in this room probably read a lot of documentation. That's why uh, my experience with CSS Day is that everyone in the room is almost just as knowledgeable as, as anyone on the stage. So that's why we have such interesting conversations. And it's all based on really diving into what's written out there, videos, examples, playing around with things. So there are, there are a lot of ways you can interpret the word documentation. And just walls of text, I totally agree. People won't read it. But examples really, really help especially with designers, uh, how can you get them to understand um, your system? So for me, this is kind of a rough overview of the kind of system that we have at the bank, um, at least from a design perspective, that documentation and education is in the middle here because that's where it should be. And that's actually the part where we have the most work to do, to be honest with you. And the components... Um, which the developers work on is a very important part, uh, but it's just one of the one of the many parts. And you could draw lines here, connecting a lot of these different things. The components contain icons as well. You can pull illustrations in. The guidelines are connected to uh, the documentation, but also the components. And guidelines are not necessarily documentation, um, the kind that I mean. When you think about visual identity. Uh, this is not new. Design systems are very, very old. Uh, this is not even that old. This was the first one that I ever saw, and this is from Apple. And uh, it was, I think I saw it around 1990, 91, so something like that, uh, when I was studying design. And this was not a huge book, but there was some, uh, there was some heft to it. You could probably hurt someone if you hit them over the head with it. Um, 
And there were a lot of details in here about how you should use the logo. And Apple is always very particular about that kind of thing. And they protect their uh, visual identity um, as they should. The funny thing about this one is there, this is from a poster. There, there's a book, but there was a poster that kind of summed up some of the things in the book. And uh, this, was, <laughs> this was the first side of the poster. Just the logo in the wrong color, which ended up being... They didn't have the flat, they had the rainbow still, right? Um, if any of you remember that, the rainbow Apple logo. So they didn't use it in one, in one color, which they do now. They just said, no, can't use it. And then you open the poster and then it was yes. And they had all these, <laughs> all these examples. So it was pretty funny. And then you get this book. Um, so to get to the, uh, the truth, it's really important to discover what's the best way to communicate to people how to use the parts of your system. Designers have trouble understanding how to use parts of a system. And when they, when they don't understand it, they'll go off and they'll make their own thing, which isn't always bad, um, but it's unnecessary in some cases. So that's very important. I had uh, a designer come up to me and say, um, yeah, I wanna make something uh, but the but it's not in the system. So what should I do? Um, so that's that's the kind of discussion that you have. Number three, design systems should strive to be complete. Um, don't worry about it. You don't need to be complete. In fact, it's probably not a good idea to try to be complete. Um, Life will help you <laughs> figure out what needs to be added to your design system, okay? This is an interesting book from Stuart Brand, How Buildings Learn. And there's a bunch of good stuff in here, but uh, one of the big takeaways for me is that the simplest buildings are the ones that adapt best over time. They're the ones that can be changed easiest over time. And uh, that's kind of a, a nice... Uh, parallel, I think, with with design systems. There was even in design. Design is very graphic design is very reactionary. Um, so there was even a style of design that was reacting to having a lot of stuff, and this was called the style. And that's a, a Dutch um, movement in design. And you might recognize the CSS Day logo, which Krein and PPK asked me to design about eight years ago, um, because it's the style. And that means the style, get it? So that's it. <laughs> the idea of the style was to, it's reductionist. Let's take all the stuff away. We're gonna go down to primary colors. We're only gonna use basic geometric forms. We're gonna kind of subtract everything and try to bring it down to an essence. It's kind of interesting because I'm not quite sure that exercise worked uh, exactly as, <laughs> as they intended, but that was, that was the intent. So um, try to keep things simple. And um, this is also very important. And I've mentioned this in other contexts as well before that refactoring, uh, it's kind of like uh, getting nervous before a presentation. I always thought, uh, um, that's an annoying thing that most people don't have that I have, and it kind of stands in the way. It's just part of the game. And refactoring is just part of the game. If you want to write code that never changes, um, well, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> you know? It's just always going to change. You, and it's okay. That's part of the, part of the job. And uh, I was talking with Vadim during the lunch, and I, I thought that was interesting. He said, well, there's this whole process uh, that a lot of the um, people who work at the browser companies we're talking about today, browser companies, I'm saying, I meant Google, but <laughs> there's this process where people try things out, developers try things, they want things, it doesn't work, they, tr they, they make some tests, they, uh, they change things. Um, it's kind of malleable, and it's this iterative process that looks a lot like the design process is, or at least should be. It's trying things out, figuring out what works based on reality, and then going back and changing what you already did. So that's, that's very normal. So if you're designing a design system, set it up for change, keep it really simple, and then um, don't, try to, don't try to anticipate everything that's gonna happen in the future. Might we need this particular kind of component? What types of variations would we have? Does it have all, uh, what states does it have? We need to know now, 
because if we don't know now, it won't be perfect. And what happens? You never get that thing in the design system. Okay? So number four, atomic design is a linear process. Um, that's because of this picture, I think. And with all due respect for Brad, Brad did never intended this as a linear process, but probably because it's in a straight line and you've got these arrows in between here. And I know Brad didn't intend this uh, to be a linear process because he said as much right after he showed that image in the book. It's not a linear process. It's a mental model to help us think of our user interfaces both as a whole and also as a collection of parts at the same time. So this is just a way of thinking. The fact that you can deconstruct something into smaller parts doesn't mean that that's the method to make a larger thing by putting smaller parts together. Okay, that's there are two very different things. You can take a page and then decide, oh, it's constructed of these things, and that's constructed of these things, right? And uh, it's funny because people uh, tend to uh, say things like, um, we're going to start doing atomic design, <laughs> you know, which is, it's not really that, I don't think it works that way. You're already doing some kind of atomic design. Everything you make is built up out of smaller parts. Okay, so it's not a method that you have to follow from start to finish. In fact, um, that's a pretty terrible idea because it goes against what we were just talking about, which is letting reality dictate um, what's logical to put into your system. So we tend to want to do this, and we should actually uh, do this. And why am I going from atoms? Because in a visual identity, atoms are the most important thing. You can construct anything from, the, from these atoms. I don't call them atoms personally, so um, they're just um, elements of visual language. You have color, you have type, you have imagery, you have you know, all these types of things. Um, there's a whole list. But you can put them together and you can see what works in the real world. So we're always talking about testing, right? If you, if you don't agree with testing, why, you know, why would we test anything? So we test things, see what works, and then we feed that back into the system, wherever, wherever it should be in there. And some things, if you're going to make something once or twice, doesn't need to be standardized, right? As long as you're using the correct visual elements and you have a review process which involves people and communication, then you'll, you're fine. You're fine. So components are useful, but not in all environments. And this implies what Russell Acoff always said as well, is um, to understand anything, you need to understand the environment, the environment that it's in. Okay, so getting to truth number four, remember that the basic building blocks of visual identity are the most important, right? Your type scale, your colors, your things like that. And then you should allow designers to discover using those. And then once you start noticing patterns, you'll notice patterns of usage. Then you can standardize and put that back into the system. Not completely unlike how the whole process works with um, discovering the standards that we use for the web. Number 4.1, design systems should predict the future. This is a hard one because what you'd love to do is go get a group of people together, get into a, a room and build a design system and then you're done with it. All you have to do is maintain it. And in order to do that, you need to know every single use case that every designer will ever encounter in any context ever in the history of the universe that you will not do that. Systems fail when you ignore the context, and you're ignoring the context if you're trying to predict it. So designing for change, again, you have to design your system so that you can learn and then pull things back into the system. That requires a different kind of thinking. So the cost of change will keep you from changing if you don't do it this way, it'll be like, oh, well, we already spent eight months doing that, you know, that one thing. And uh, now we can't change it. So that's a, that's a pain, right? So. Beer. You didn't know I was going to say that. So you're bad at predicting the future. Don't try to do it with your design system. 
Um, here's one, uh, number five. And a lot of these, you notice, are probably not geared toward you as developers, Mark, but more geared toward uh, designers. But uh, the idea that having choices replaces thought. So a true story, a designer came up to me and said, um, the, uh, I have this thing the, that I designed, and the, de the team said, we can't build it. Why not? because the things I made aren't all in the design system. <laughs> so they can't build it. Uh, this is kind of a bad uh, thing. But what we notice is that we're in a situation where graphic design was around 1960 or so, when um, kind of modernist design, modernist typography was happening. Um, grid systems. Yet designers were kind of seen up to a certain point as these freewheeling kind of artists, artsy fartsy types and they were just doing all kinds of things, and there was no rhyme or reason to what they did, and they just made stuff. It was kind of magical, right? So there was this whole, again, graphic design is reactionary, just much like art, uh, this thing about um, let, let's do uh, systems, you know, grid systems. Let's get these together. There was Carl Gerstner uh, wrote this book, which became very popular, called Designing Programs. Not programs like computer programs, but... Um, programs of design. And his work was based off of an astronomer um, named Fritz Zwicky. And Fritz Zwicky was uh, convinced that cause and effect, uh, causal uh, relationships was not always uh, sufficient to describe complex problems. So he started this thing called morphological analysis. So you can take, it's kind of like CSS, they call them attributes, but it's basically properties and values. And you can kind of make a matrix of these things, and then you can um, come up with crazy ideas. And it looks kind of like, um, like this. This is a morphological table that Gerstner made in that book um, about typography. So the idea is you could say, okay, I need, I need some type. So I'll say, go to appearance, and I'll look at size, and then I can kind of just decide what I'm going to do. I'll, I'll, I'll do small, and then the proportion will be broad, and I'll choose lean boldness, and then I'll make it oblique. So you can kind of zigzag across here, and you can get all these combinations, and it was kind of a way to get creative, <laughs> right? Uh, and because it's in a table, I guess, it was a systematized way to get creative. Um, uh, there are reasons to maybe not believe this uh, works in, in a lot of cases. And one of them is this field here called something else, which basically means do whatever the hell you want, <laughs> right? You can just um, use things, th these things or not. So uh, th you could do something like this conceivably, but then you'd have to really limit these properties and values that people can choose from. And then you're actually limiting creativity. And that might work um, if you're trying to get people to do things a certain way. But the idea that Gerstner had was that you could blindly, uh, you can blindly choose something and then have a, a pretty interesting design. And with all respect for uh, my blind friends, that's exactly what it would look like if that was your method of design, like it was designed by a blind person. So... Um, the system is just a tool. Grids are just a tool. We've had them for many years, and then we, they came to the web, and people were falling all over themselves, you know, uh, grid conferences and all that kind of stuff. It's a tool. I'm sure there are hammer conferences, but that's kind of the thing that we're talking about. So just treat it as a tool. Um, number six, design systems are as important as we currently make them out to be. So do you... I want you to think very hard on this one because it's, it's really a difficult question. And they're not. They're not. And of course, this is my opinion. Um, I am right, but it's still an opinion. <laughs> um, what are design systems for? What is CSS for? If you really get to a high level, what do we want? What's the end goal? Anyone? Sorry? Consistency, yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, one that's um, put out there quite a bit. I'll, I'll uh, pose it this to you. I think it's beauty. I think what we want is more beauty. And what is beauty? Well, I'll tell you quickly what it means to me. 
and then we can uh, talk about it a little more. This is a um, gentleman named Andy Williams. This is uh, what he looked like when I met him, um, and he passed away a while back. This was the the studio, uh, or the studio, the theater that he had um, close to where I went to school. This was in Branson, Missouri. Andy Williams was a singer. Um, you'd have to be pretty old, I think. I didn't listen to his music, really, but he was popular for, especially for one single called Moon River. Um, and this was the inside of the theater. And behind that stage, he had an apartment. And a friend of mine, April, worked at this theater, and she said to me, Andy's got this really big art collection, um, and no one really likes to see it. Um, so he'd be thrilled if you, if you wanted to meet him and you're interested. So I did a double major. I also studied, uh, I'm a painter. I, I studied that as well. And so I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to go meet this guy. And I wasn't sure what to expect. I didn't know what it means when someone says, come to my apartment and look at my art collection. Uh, <laughs> But this is what he had in there. And if any of you know art and you know Klaus Oldenburg, then you know that this, this is a duffel bag that's made to look like a baked potato. This is kind of a, a classic thing. And then a Jackson Pollock was there too. And it wasn't even on the wall. It was like leaned up against something here. And I touched it. Don't tell anybody. I touched the corner. I'm respectful, okay? But I touched the corner of it, and it was a real Jackson Pollock. I couldn't believe it. was like a museum. It was amazing. And um, that's, that's something that I already liked, but you can find that kind of, I like these things because I find them to be beautiful in some way. Um, what I also find to be beautiful, you can see in processes. This is Charles Sparnay. This is a uh, Dutch super hyper-realist painter. Amazing. The process that he goes through to make these things is, is fantastic. So the paintings are beautiful. The process is beautiful as well. Uh, the process, if you've ever seen Willem de Koning, uh, there are some rare old uh, videos of him painting. It's just fascinating to watch. It's like um, you're mesmerized by it. It's beautiful. Chris had a really nice talk about color, and Frank Stella has these really nice paintings that use color in these interesting ways. I love that. Um, it was mentioned in my intro that I uh, started my uh, design career as a very young teenage graffiti artist, and my hero at that time was Richard Mirando, also known as Scene, um, also known as the godfather of uh, graffiti, and um, it was just uh, amazing stuff. David Sally, a New York painter, um, putting things together that shouldn't be put together, and somehow these things worked, these compositions work, and his graphic design counterpart, uh, David Carson, who just basically gave the big middle finger to uh, design at that moment. Again, graphic design is reactionary. And um, he did this kind of crazy stuff with typography that looked and was influenced by um, found uh, typography on those walls where posters are half torn off and, and things like that. Paul Rand, beautiful work um, all the time. And what I like about him is he could do something like this and he could do something completely different like this. So this was a designer who had a very systematic way of working, but his work was very tailored to the client. So you didn't see a particular Paul Rand style um, all the time. Michael Barut and his team at Pentagram, the MIT Media Lab uh, Visual Identity, which is uh, um, exciting to look at, and you can really uh, stare at it for a long time. And they, they made a complete system here. So if you're talking about systems, visual identity systems, I think this is very beautiful, as well as uh, Vignelli's um, uh, New York City transport uh, signage system. Uh, this is a real system yeah, at play. Susan Kerr's icons for Apple. Um, still some of the most whimsical, uh, fun. The, just these icons gave you... Um, they influence the feeling that you had when you turned on your computer. And that's pretty amazing. Uh, so this, uh, this little, this is a trash can by Enzo Mari. And the brilliant thing about it is how many times have you like reached under your desk and you throw something in there and then it hits the side of the, <laughs> the trash can and then bounces off. This is a beautiful design. It's just slightly slanted. Um, this Memphis, uh, Memphis design, I, I like a lot of these things. This is a bookshelf. Uh, Gaetano Pesce, uh, this chair, which um, 
you wouldn't sit in. I had a friend who had one, and I almost sat in it, and he got pretty upset. <laughs> so you don't want to sit in this thing. It's very, very expensive. Um, but what did I know? I didn't know about um, physical product design. So, And uh, this is Brendan Dawes, who does a lot of crazy, uh, interesting stuff with 3D, as well as uh, Rafik Anadol, uh, these huge, immersive installations that are just uh, run... Um, he doesn't do it alone. He has a studio in California, and it's, these are AI uh, projected sculptures, basically. And uh, places, right? Porto or um, Portugal. I love it. My son, my youngest son, when, he, when I went to give him food, and he'd hold that spoon in his mouth. So relationships with people, certain moments that you have can be beautiful as well. And any kind of moment you have with people that you care about um, could be very beautiful. Um, but I get it. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It is true. And, um, but is it completely true? So if you look at these two forms, left and right, this is an experiment from uh, Gestalt psychology. Um, you might know it. There are two words, takete and maluma. Um, if I say takete, uh, which one? Which one should I pick, left or right? Right? Yeah? And Maluma? Left? Okay. So there's like a consensus here. Takete and Maluma, they're, they're made up words. They don't mean anything in any language. So somehow we have a feeling, we have associations between form, um, letters, sounds, and things that we might not even know what those associations are. So do we have a completely different idea of beauty? I don't know. Who likes this Apple logo? I heard someone was here from Apple, but this was probably before your time, so sorry about that. Um, this is a really awful logo. This is just terrible. It's, if you look at logo design, this is, it's, it's verges on disgusting. And <laughs> what about this, right? This, uh, and this one, kerning. If I, can you imagine coming home and someone's like, honey, I asked for flickering lights. You gave me fuckering lights. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the importance of kerning. Now, this is an example from uh, work, which is a bank, which means I had to blur all the text. Um, the thing at the top says, geautomatiseerde controle op beheersmaatregelen cash. I have no idea what that means. So I figure you'll have no idea what that means. But this is a PowerPoint slide. Sorry, not sorry for the colleagues who made that slide. <laughs> Here's an interesting one from uh, UI that, that's also at work, which I can be ashamed of. Um, it says, uh, please fill in the fields with an exclamation point. Or, or it says, will you, fill, will you fill in the fields with an exclamation point? Thanks. <laughs> Here's another PowerPoint slide. We have these brand new illustrations, which work great, but only on a white background. And they're intended for only on a white background. That's intentional. Of course, there's always going to be someone who comes along, and I've blurred their names. And please, my colleagues, don't tell them I showed this here. Um, they put it on a blue background, which looks terrible, but there are also things happening with typography here. And uh, also something very interesting happening with the logo. <laughs> um, this is a poster. Uh, these are the reasons I came to work at this bank. Uh, because I thought, this is something I would like to change. And, um, and we're, we're actually doing a pretty good job with it right now. So this is, uh, this is I think, an important thing that Paul Rand said. Um, actually, now that I see it again, I, I don't want to read it. But it's basically saying, if you say that aesthetics, and when I say beauty, I also mean aesthetics, if you say that's irrelevant, if you separate that from, uh, from the product, then um, you're fragmenting the work. And it'll be, it'll be bad for your product, it'll be bad for the, the designer, the maker of the product as well. And um, designer uh, Victor Papanek uh, said something similar. We're always talking about form versus function and things like that. 
I like his function complex because he said that aesthetics is part of function. So there are other parts of function here, uh, need and use and method and such, but aesthetics is part of the function. And I agree with that. And uh, we saw, we've seen some examples of that as well. And if I think about CSS, I think that what we're seeing is a lot of very creative people working on ways to make things more beautiful. Whatever beautiful means is what Jeremy alluded to yesterday. These are agreements that you make within a particular context of what constitutes uh, beautiful. And we, do, we try to do this by uh, exploration, um, and figuring out what works best in the real world. This is a piece of our um, some of the things that we've decided upon as far as uh, typography goes. And the result is that we want to go from what's on the left to what's on the right. And this is already happening. And this is done with a design system, but not a component library necessarily. That helps, but there's a complete system at play here. Going from the thing on the left to the thing on the right. And those were small changes. This is a bigger change going from um, what's on the left to the right. Typ typographically, very small changes, things you can do with CSS, you can um, get from something that's unrefined to more refined. And you can do this on things like an app as well. So aesthetics are part of function and uh, form the purpose of the system. I think the reason for being for design systems is to create a better world, which also includes the aesthetics of it. And there are more things that, uh, that have to do with beauty, um, but aesthetics is, is part of that. So, reality should inform design systems and design systems should in, uh, inform reality, which is what I said before. But I think there's one thing that's missing here, and we talked about it a little bit with a couple people today. And that is that we're always trying to create a proxy tool for designers. Things like Figma, with all respect for Figma, it's great, it's way better than Photoshop for designers, but it's still not the thing that gives us the most power. All the creative ideas that we've seen today and yesterday, the things that we can do with CSS. And I think CSS should be one of the things that informs design decisions. And the only way for people to do that is to know about what CSS can do. So we have to teach designers in a friendly way, and I hope that designers can see CSS as a tool, um, but it's, we're in this really exciting thing. And after um, even working on the web for as many years uh, as I and some other people have, it's still exciting every single day. I come to conferences like this, and I see what, everything that people are talking about, and it's just as new as it was back then. And it's never stopping. And I think it's fantastic. And this is what designers should also be a part of so that they can use CSS as a tool. And all these scroll snapping, um, fancy things that we've been talking about uh, the past couple of days, they can start getting ideas based on that to inject into their work. Instead of um, developers having to just uh, do these boring things because designers don't know what's possible. So I want to leave you with a, um, a quote by architect Lewis Kahn. The design is not making beauty, but beauty emerges. It emerges from selection and affinities and integration and love. Thank you. I think we can all be in agreement that that was a beautiful talk. So I would like to invite you here. We have time for one question. Uh, for Sorry about that. Extra questions. Stephen is around, and you can always drop your questions to him later. So the question we will cover is: What do we do if we already have a design system that happens to not be very simple? Like, how can we get back to simplicity in that system? Yeah, that's a <laughs> look at the time. <laughs> um, that's a hard. It's none of these problems are easy, and so this is a hard problem. The approach that I would take w would be to get a group of people together that work on the system, and also people outside of the system because that's really important. And then look at usage. Like if it's too uh, expanded, I can guarantee 
that 80% is probably not used. Maybe it's not 80%, but it's definitely the, the Pareto uh, principle happening where you have a, you know, um, a larger amount that's not used compared to the smaller amount that's used all the time. So then um, maybe if you inventory that, you can come up with a plan for uh, kind of deprecating uh, things that aren't used anymore. Um, our developers are in the same kind of a situation right now, and it's hard. You know, they're uh, they're working really hard to um, to uh, deprecate things. You almost have to work as hard at deprecating things as creating new things. So, so it seems like it's kind of a how should we put this? It's like a step by step. Small small things add up to big things, kind of an approach. Yeah. And you do need everyone involved to be in agreement that this is what we want to do. We want to simplify things, and that's how we go about it, right? Something. Yeah, I'm, I um, I try to be careful with consensus. That's one of the things I really don't like about large organizations. But you need to get. There's a difference between uh, get getting everyone to agree with something and deciding something and informing the right people about it and, and taking them along in the process, um, that sometimes feeling involved is just, um, is enough. Mm. And they don't have to decide uh, with you, so. No, I think that's very wise. So once again, please give it up for Stephen Hay.